Hey, everybody, and welcome back to Professional Development, the New York City Teacher Podcast. Last week was a really big week for the show. We had our first ever bonus episode in addition to another Patreon exclusive episode. The bonus episode was about a possible threat to New York City DOE teachers as unionized laborers. And that is sort of the subject area that we will be following up on in a roundabout kind of way today. Since that episode aired, There's been another rally at Foley Square organized by Teachers for Choice, and the New York State Supreme Court issued a restraining order against the city's vaccine mandate for municipal workers. This ruling was in response to the lawsuit filed by the MLC, which stands for the Municipal Labor Committee, to which the UFT, our teachers union, is a party. Fortunately, for those of us who have returned to the building, the restraining order is only temporary, pending a hearing on September 22nd, which is five days before the mandate would have gone into effect anyway. The UFT's participation in the MLC lawsuit uh, is based on the fact that there were no medical or religious exemptions made to the rule that all public school employees needed to be vaccinated. Now, when it comes to religious and medical exemptions, we're talking about a very small pool of the UFT membership. Uh, And the individuals who protested on Monday at Foley Square are not part of that pool. Uh, In fact, if the coverage of the event is representative of what actually happened at the rally, uh, most of the people in attendance were not even teachers. The one article that seems to have been recirculated by all of the news outlets features interviews with Amy and Bill Carroll, Wade Willett, and Alicia uh, Morell. Of those four, only one is a teacher. The Carrolls and Mr. Willett are retirees, leaving Ms. Morell as the, the sole teacher represented in a rally that made headlines as Teachers marched through New York City to protest vaccine mandates, and education community protests vaccine mandates in Manhattan demonstration. Now, I thought I might stop by just to check it out for myself and see if I might get a sense of of who was really attending these rallies. Uh, But when I did the math, it didn't make sense. And here's why. The rally was Monday, September 13th, the first day of school. Uh, and, and it started at 4 p.m. Monday, for most DOE schools, includes an 80-minute block of time uh, directly after the school day for professional development. Not podcasting, uh, but the actual process of professional development. So if your school day ends after 2.40 p.m., as mine does, the rally started before the school day had contractually ended. If, on top of that you teach somewhere in an outer borough. The earliest you could hope to arrive at Foley Square might be 5 or 5.30 or even later. If you drive, uh, you might not get there until the next day, as traffic in the city and the outer boroughs has been as bad as or worse than pre-pandemic levels. Having taken part in conversations around organizing rallies, I know that rule number one is to figure out how to get the biggest group out to the event as possible, as big rallies are more effective than small rallies. If the goal is to make it clear to policymakers that their constituents want something and are motivated to get that something, it is better to bring a whole lot of constituents. So why would Teachers for Choice plan a rally that started during the school day when the individuals who would be most impacted by the vaccine mandate were still in their buildings? This might provide further backing for my hypothesis that this group has less to do with teachers than they would like the general public to think. But enough of that. 
The main subject of today's episode is the UFT, the teachers union representing teachers that Teachers for Choice is attempting to defund. Today, we're exploring the fascinating history behind the union so that we might better understand what it has done for teachers in New York City, what it continues to do, and what it could do better. The United Federation of Teachers is a pretty young organization in the grand scheme of things, turning 61 this year. The UFT was not the first teachers union in New York City. In fact, prior to the founding of the UFT, there were over a hundred different teacher groups, which was itself something of a problem and which led directly to the birth of the UFT as none of these groups had collective bargaining rights. Thus, the UFT was the result of teachers represented by the Teachers Guild, the most direct predecessor to the UFT, and others of the High School Teachers Association joining forces in pursuit of better working conditions. The leaders of this effort on the Guild end were Al Shanker, George Altamere, and Dan Sanders, who became known as the Young Turks. Uh, after the group that attempted to modernize the Ottoman Empire in the early 20th century, uh, because they began to push the old guard of the Teachers Guild in the direction of bolder attempts to secure power for teachers. They worked with David Selden, uh, who was an American Federation of Teachers, or AFT, organizer, and with teachers from the HSTA, to come to an agreement that took their common interests into account. The main ingredient of this agreement was a provision in their salary demands proposal for what is today known as the promotional differential, whereby uh, the salary is standardized in a sliding scale that increases based on years in the DOE and additional education beyond the minimum for credentialing. At the time, high school teachers were required to have more education than elementary teachers. For that reason, uh, they felt they should be paid more. So the promotional differential was a compromise that allowed for pay to be tied to education as opposed to position. So it wasn't that high school teachers were being paid more than elementary school teachers because they were high school teachers. Uh, They were instead being paid more because they had more education. So it was possible for elementary teachers to get more education and get paid more. They would have access to the same promotional differential. So with the interests of primary and secondary teachers thus aligned, the Young Turks set up the Committee for Action Through Unity to gauge support for a merger of the unions. There was immediate and overwhelming support, and so the United Federation of Teachers, AFT Local 2, was born on March 16, 1960. Right away, the UFT sent demands to the Board of Education. Collective bargaining was issue number one, with raises, pay for a master's degree, that promotional differential we talked about, uh, duty-free lunches for elementary teachers, sick days for full-time subs, and the ability to collect dues via payroll deductions rather than by hand, making the list as well. The board stalled, so a strike date was set. The superintendent promised to invoke the Condon Wadlin Act, which was a precursor to the Taylor Law that outlawed strikes by public employees, automatically fired strikers, and would only allow public employees who went on strike to be rehired under the conditions of a five-year probationary period and three-year pay freeze. Mayor Robert F. Wagner Jr. stepped in to avert the strike. Uh, He made a series of promises that he broke subsequently, so then a new strike date was set in November of the same year. This time, they followed through. 
Of the roughly 45,000 teachers in New York City at the time, only about 5,600 walked picket lines and only about 2,000 more called in sick. Not particularly impressive numbers. It looked like the Condon Wadlin Act might even be enforced. Uh, but David Dubinsky, president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, swooped in after one day to mediate an agreement between the UFT and the mayor. A fact finding panel, made up of Dubinsky and two other labor leaders, was appointed to make a recommendation based on the facts surrounding the one day strike. And two months later, it recommended collective bargaining with an election to determine the representative bargaining agent. The UFT won the election and set about the process of bargaining on behalf of Board of Education teachers. The BOE stalled and Mayor Wagner and Governor Rockefeller couldn't come to an agreement about who would pick up how much of the tab to pay for the UFT demands. There were offers and counter offers back and forth until delegates voted nine to one to issue a strike vote to the membership in April 1962. 5,000 members showed up to vote and the strike authorization carried by a narrow margin of just 313 votes. The UFT was prepared for the strike this time with a network established by Altamir to include five borough coordinators and a representative in each of the 52 administrative districts who could coordinate with the rank and file membership. 20,000 teachers walked out for this strike. Governor Rockefeller found more money to help foot the bill for the UFT's demands, and Mayor Wagner offered the striking teachers amnesty from the Condon Wadlin Act. Rockefeller also pledged to reform the act, which was too draconian to actually enforce, uh, and so five years later, the Taylor Law came to be. The success of the strike and the collective bargaining agreement that was signed shortly thereafter stoked the fires of unionization among teachers across the country. By the mid-1970s, teaching was one of the most unionized jobs in the country, inspiring other government workers to organize as well. Now, for the next act of this story, we'll need to reintroduce some characters we met earlier, along with a few new characters that play major roles in the conflict to come. Albert Shanker, the young Turk who helped negotiate the merger between the Teachers Guild and the High School Teachers Association, was a teacher at IS-126, about 10 blocks away from the PD Podcast Studio headquarters, also known as my apartment, in Astoria. He was also an intellectual disciple of Max Schachtman, a former Trotskyist who went on to champion a conservative form of social democracy that made him a helpful ally within organized labor to the anti-communist wave of McCarthyism. Schachman lived a very interesting life, and his political evolution covered a pretty broad gamut as he went from associate of Leon Trotsky to anti-communist mentor to AFL-CIO staff. His influence on the UFT via his personal friend Al Shanker can still be felt today, as we'll soon see. Finally, the Teachers Union, also known as TU, was founded in New York in 1916 as AFT Local 5 and was the first labor union founded for teachers in New York City. The early work of the TU centered on protecting teachers from the Red Scare, beginning in 1919. Much of the membership of the TU overlapped with the Communist Party USA, or CPUSA, which resulted in its getting tangled up in the political intrigue surrounding communist politics in the U.S. during the 20s and 30s. At the same time, the CPUSA was factionalizing and uh, burning itself out in infighting and adding more and more Uh, plants and informants to its member lists, uh, so too was the TU falling prey to the same sorts of pitfalls. 
One particularly fascinating example can be found in Benjamin Mandel, also known as Bert Miller, who was a New York City school teacher and communist labor activist who served as a district secretary in the TU in the 20s, but later renounced communism to become the director of research for the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, um, and then later the Senate Internal Security Subcommittee. These were two organizations that featured prominently in the Red Scare. One of HUAC's many claims to fame is that it decided against opening an investigation into the KKK in 1946, as it decided it was just, you know, one of these harmless old American institutions and chose instead to look into whether or not the Communist Party had infiltrated the Works Progress Administration, or the WPA. At any rate, when the TU wasn't being infiltrated by informants or fighting amongst its own factions, it was both a labor union and a social movement. It sought early on to gain recognition for teachers as professionals and respect from administration, higher salaries, and academic freedom, including protection from loyalty oaths, which obviously would have been very important for teachers who were also affiliated with CPUSA. By the 20s, the TU sought smaller class sizes and more aid from the state, two demands that were for the common good of students, families, and teachers. Above all, the TU was militantly anti-racist, pro-community politics, and ready to engage in mass struggle. This populist egalitarian commitment to achieving positive outcomes for both families and teachers, as well as its interest in academic freedom, made it appear particularly threatening to McCarthyites, who found a willing ally in the Teachers Guild, which went on to become the UFT. Shanker, who had learned everything he needed to know about collaborating with the powers that be to limit the influence of communist organizations, was elected president of the UFT in 1964, which was the same year the much maligned uh, TU finally gave up the fight against both external and internal pressures and dissolved, encouraging its membership to join the UFT and attempt to have some positive influence on the new union. By 1968, the TU had been dead for four years, and the UFT was the only game in town for teachers. They had flexed their organizational capacity by going on strike four times in less than a decade. As we already discussed, they went on strike in 1960 for union recognition, 1962 for a contract. Later on in 1964, they went on strike to have procession work included as part of collective bargaining. And then in 1967, to secure smaller class sizes, a raise, and importantly, the ability to remove disruptive students from classes. And here's a little editorial aside for you. Experienced teacher listeners likely involuntarily heard a record scratch sound effect there at the mention of ability to remove disruptive students from classes. Historically, in the city of New York, disruptive students codes for students of color and or poor students. Uh, So this is as close to a dog whistle for limiting the provision of education as you can find in a teacher contract negotiation. Yet, it was the major cause of the 1967 strike. This is the point where it became crystal clear to a lot of parents of black and brown children in the city that the UFT was not a social movement union like the TU might have been, but was instead more akin to a craft union, looking out for its own exclusive interests related to wages and working conditions, and really doing whatever it took to achieve its goals. As Jeff mentioned in our bonus episode last week, craft unions in the US have a rocky history. They may have played a pivotal role in securing some semblance of power for workers at the cost of the bosses, 
but they, they, they've they not always distributed these gains equally amongst the laborer class. Uh, historically, they've typically reserved the lion's share exclusively for their own, or in other words, for, for white men. Anyway, the 1967 strike was 14 days long. It included 50,000 teachers, and it got Al Shanker arrested in one of the first tests of the newly minted Taylor Law. Nonetheless, it secured as part of the resulting contract not only a procedure for removing disruptive students from the classroom, but also a new salary differential for 30 credits beyond a master's degree. So uh, the UFT got what they wanted. One other important development on the timeline, uh, this one unrelated to the 1967 strike, was that in 1966, the UFT established the Welfare Fund jointly with the Board of Education, uh, by which UFT members gained fully paid hospital and medical insurance, a choice of health care plans, and a union-administered fund uh, offering supplementary benefits like prescription drugs, eyeglasses, and a dental plan. And for any newer teachers listening to the show, uh, now's as good a time as any to make sure that you have signed up for your UFT Welfare Fund benefits. Um, go do that right now if you haven't yet. <laughs> 1968 marked the year of the longest teacher strike in New York City history when teachers went on strike for 36 school days in response to the dismissal of 18 white educators by the Ocean Hill-Brownsville Community Control School Board. A lot has been written on this topic by excellent researchers, and there's an episode of the School Colors podcast that I will link in the episode description as Mark Winston Griffith and Max Friedman do a truly stellar job of reporting on the events surrounding the Ocean Hill Brownsville Community Control School Board and the strike. I would definitely recommend queuing that episode for right after this one finishes uh, or whenever you get a chance. It, it's really fantastic. Um, but the long story short of this period in the educational history of New York City is that a community controlled school board had been established in the predominantly black and Puerto Rican neighborhood of Ocean Hill Brownsville. The board dismissed 18 teachers who were hampering the progress of the project of community controlled school boards. The UFT argued their due process had not been adequately observed and thus it organized a massive strike. Again, the longest teacher strike in New York City history uh, to try and get the teachers reinstated, which they were. And the community controlled school board project was shut down. Fast forward to today, and New York City's public schools remain hopelessly segregated, and though the majority of the student population consists of students of color, the majority of teachers are white. The UFT's official stance on the episode remains unapologetic to this day, as this passage that I'll quote from a book celebrating the union's 50th anniversary attests. The union had to protect the due process rights of its members, or it could not have survived. The union also believed that it was important to stand up for a colorblind, religion-blind, egalitarian society. The very commitment that had put the UFT in the forefront of the civil rights movement. I personally would tend to agree with Stephen Breyer, however, uh, in his claim that I'll quote from an article he wrote three years ago on the same subject. UFT unionism in the 1960s was thus built on a toxic combination of Shachmanite anti-communist ideology, craft union consciousness, and an embrace of teacher professionalism tinged with an obsessive emphasis on the menace of community involvement and black nationalism. That ideological brew helps explain the obdurate nature of the UFT's political and organizational responses during and after the 1968 strikes. The community control forces not only needed to be defeated when they tried to change the governance of local schools, they also had to be rooted out 
defamed, and finally destroyed. Schachtman had always promoted this kind of hostile response to political enemies, as had Schenker's predecessors in the purge of the TU in the 1950s. Schenker himself exhibited the same level of hostility, undertaking political vendettas against the community control forces and those who supported them. The Union's ideological rigidity and racism poisoned for decades the possibilities of building viable alliances between teachers and working class and poor communities of color in New York City. For this week's news update, we sort of started the episode with a bit of news, so we'll bookend it with the remainder. Students have been back with us in school now for three days. By the time this airs, we will have finished our fourth instructional day, and as of Tuesday evening, 105 students and 113 staff have tested positive for COVID, requiring full closures and quarantine of at least 58 classrooms, as well as 86 partial closures. While no schools have been fully shut down due to widespread COVID transmission, the closure of individual classrooms means hundreds of students have started the school year with little to no in-person learning. On a personal note, I received my first confirmed case with potential exposure notice today, meaning that someone on staff at my school has tested positive, so fingers crossed that they have a speedy recovery, And fingers crossed also that I don't hear anything from the test and trace folks in the next day or so. Uh, And and fingers crossed also that everybody listening manages to stay safe and as far away from exposure to COVID as possible. Because I don't want to end the show on such a low note, uh, not only a really ugly moment in the UFT's history, but also 218 documented cases of COVID in two days of teaching, I want to wrap up with a bit of good news from the show. We've passed the 200 listens mark, which is huge for such a niche show, and hopefully just the beginning. I thought it might be cool to see what we might be able to make as a community around this show. So I'm going to try something. At the bottom of this episode description, you will find a Google form that will allow you the means to submit either a text response or an audio file or both uh, in response to this question. What is one thing you want to share with first year teachers? Now, if you are an experienced teacher, maybe this is a piece of advice you wish you had had as a first year teacher. If you're a parent, Maybe this is something you want your child's teacher to keep in mind as they get to know the students in the first few weeks of school. If you are any other stakeholder, maybe it's just a word of encouragement to these workers who have chosen to take on the task of fulfilling one of our society's greatest needs. It can be totally anonymous, or you could feel free to share a first name and last initial if you want. Uh, As text responses and audio files roll in, I'll program them into one or a few episode segments, depending on what sort of response rate we get. And not to worry, this assignment is what we might call enrichment. In other words, totally optional. So this concludes the first episode in a several part series on the history of the UFT. We'll cover the good, the bad, and the ugly so that we end up with as complete a picture as possible of the organization that on the one hand we need for the purposes of collective bargaining and healthcare, and on the other hand, has more than its fair share of historical blemishes. If you have any particular insight into the UFT, either historically or in the present day, be sure to reach out as it's a really wonderful thing to have guests on the show. I enjoy it immensely, and I'm sure it's it's a, a, a great thing to have a break from my voice. Uh, so thank you so much to listeners who have already reached out via email to professionaldevelopmentpodcast at gmail.com. It's great to hear from you. Um, and if you haven't reached out yet, we'd love to hear from you. If you like what you're hearing, 
be sure to subscribe wherever you do your podcast listening, but also consider checking out patreon.com slash professional development for two additional episodes every month. With that, happy first week of of school. Uh, We made it and we'll see you next week. Same time at patreon.com slash professional development.